Hey everyone, God bless you and thanks a lot for tuning in. My reflection today, I am entitling The Deacon. But before I launch into a reflection on the diaconate, I want you to know that uh, this Saturday, I'm going to be hosting a Zoom on the subject of uh, our most recent series, Heaven, Our True Home. If you'd like to participate, you can simply go to the PNP site and uh, sign up there. If you purchase Heaven, that series of lectures, uh, an email will be sent to you with a Zoom link for this Saturday morning, 9.30 a.m. PST. Also, you should know that uh, you don't want to miss our summer sales going on at PMP for a little bit longer, 30% off. Appreciate your support and anything you can do to help us reach people. The reason I want to reflect upon the subject of the deacon today is because of whose feast it is. Today is the feast of the holy archdeacon and martyr Lawrence uh, of Rome. What a marvelous saint. This is mid-third century. Archdeacon Lawrence is uh, dearly loved and one of the most famous deacon saints in the church. In fact, several other deacons of Rome were martyred at the same time. I think four in total uh, who served the Pope at the time. Also, tomorrow uh, is a feast day, St. Euplus the Deacon, the Holy Martyr Euplus the Deacon. So uh, these days are focused on the, the deacons. And I thought I would say a word about how precious deacons are. St. Lawrence was entrusted by the Pope uh, with the care of uh, the liturgy and with the care of the poor, charitable responsibilities and liturgical responsibilities as well. Pope Fabian, who this is around 236 to 250, um, Pope Fabian divided the Church of Rome into seven districts and appointed a deacon over each of the seven districts. And Archdeacon Lawrence is the most famous and the most beloved of those deacons. Pope Sixtus, who succeeded Fabian, I think around 250, and was killed just before uh, St. Lawrence was, entrusted to St. Lawrence, the vessels of the church, the sacred chalices and all of the sacred accoutrements of the church for the services, as well as the poor. And after Pope Sixtus was martyred, uh, it was time for Lawrence himself to be summoned. And when he was summoned, he was required to bring the treasures of the church because uh, the pagan emperors wanted to plunder the church. And Lawrence gathered all of the poor and brought the poor to the emperor and said, Behold, the treasures of the church. <laughs> what, what a beautiful word uh, indeed. Then he himself was stripped and martyred, but he was martyred uh, by being barbecued, basically. He was plant placed on hot, hot gridiron and made no complaint about it, embraced, in fact, his martyrdom. And then after he had been some time burning on one side, he requested that he be turned over so that he could be properly prepared uh, to be offered to Christ. Beautifully, uh, in the Synaxarian of the church, in the liturgical verses uh, that we read in the Orthro service this morning for St. Lawrence, we call St. Lawrence the sea bass, the sea bass of the church who was uh, properly cooked for Christ's sake. What a marvelous witness to the, the fearlessness, the joyful confidence that true Christians have uh, in the face of death when they are firmly attached to Christ our Savior, the vanquisher of death. What exactly is the role of the deacon? Why are deacons important and why did Christ institute the diaconate? Well, there are two fundamental reasons why the church has an ordained office of a servant. Diakonia means service. Diakonos is the servant or the deacon. The deacon is a model servant, and in this represents Christ to the community. Jesus himself came as the one who is the perfect servant, the servant of God, his Father, and the servant of God's people, us. He says, I have not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. That's why Christ came. And the diaconate represents him in that sacred 
orientation towards the people of God. How that actually works itself out uh, in the church is primarily in, in two ways, in a liturgical function that the deacon has and also in a charitable function that he has in the parish, in each and every parish where there are deacons. The function of the deacon in the liturgy is fundamental. In fact, uh, the, the liturgy itself is really run and organized, choreographed by the deacon. He's the one who sets the tone so that the priest can stand at the holy altar to pray. The deacon calls to prayer, in peace let us pray to the Lord. The deacon comes out of the holy place with the blessing of the priest, stands on the solea, and then calls the people to prayer. And then the priest leads them in prayer, and they all say the Amen, making a collective, unified prayer before the Holy Trinity. For most of Christian history, uh, the, di the diaconate has been front and center in the liturgical life of the church. And as a matter of fact, uh, it's my understanding, I think I read this in uh, St. Athanasius the Great, that for a long time, the great entrance, the magnificent presentation of uh, the wine and bread that has been set apart in the uh, service of the liturgy to be offered to God and then received by the Lord and returned to us as his body and blood by a transformation worked by the Holy Spirit, that that great entrance uh, for many centuries was led by the deacons and not by the priests. Now the deacons and the priests go on that great entrance. Uh, but my point is that the deacons have always had this fundamental kind of central point of reference to guide uh, the Holy Liturgy. The subdeacons primarily are made to serve the deacon who is there to enable the priest to function in his priestly capacity. That's also the same uh, orientation that the deacons have with regards to charity. The fathers of the church point to Act 6 in the consecration of those seven mighty men who uh, have been understood to be the, ori the origination of the diaconate. They were called to meet a practical charitable concern in the church uh, of the uh, in Jerusalem in the early days. There was a great need for caring for the widows, and there was controversy going on, and the Holy Spirit inspired the apostles to set apart these great men, uh, these seven great men, so that the apostles could be dedicated to the word of God in prayer. And that's exactly how the diaconate functions today. Uh, the deacons call to prayer and organize the prayer of the liturgy so that the priests can be undistracted in their praying, and so that they themselves can be dedicated to off making the offering and also to the preaching of the word of God uh, in, to the congregation. The word of God in prayer is, remains the fundamental calling of priests and the deacons enable them both liturgically and in the administration of the parish uh, in the caring for the charitable needs of the parish to be able to be focused. The deacons enable the priests to be focused on the word of God in prayer. I have had, a, 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 I would say, a a spoiled life liturgically because when I was ordained, I was ordained in a church that had a great collection of deacons. <laughs> I'm uh, tempted to share a little joke uh, about the deacons. This joke comes from our dear friend, uh, Bishop Irenee of uh, Western Europe. He has shared with us uh, a question that no doubt has uh, arisen in any priest's mind where there are a number of deacons serving. And that is, what do you call uh, a collection of de deacons? You have a gaggle of geese, right? You have a flock of birds. You have a herd of this and that. What do you call a collection of deacons? A nuisance of deacons. <laughs> forgive me, forgive me, dear deacons, uh, for suggesting anything like that at all. No, I, in fact, have been completely spoiled. Uh, when I was a young priest and an assistant priest, I was in a parish of uh, lovely servant deacons. And uh, when I became a pastor in 1998, uh, I have been very blessed since that time to serve with uh, my proto-deacon Lee and also a number of other deacons, who most of whom have become priests and are elsewhere now. But this last summer, I have been serving with three deacons in every service, and uh, it's really a priest's dream to be able to serve with such God-fearing, 
uh, loving deacons uh, who really elevate uh, the divine services to a place where they need to be faith-filled and with the fear of God and reverence in the services. The diaconate is not a stepping stone. The diaconate is not a stepping stone. The diaconate is a, an ancient office in the church, ordained office, and uh, it should be embraced. And maybe you yourself are thinking about the fact that God may be calling you to become a deacon. Some who are called to be priests, of course, will be deacons, and a priest and a bishop never cease being deacons. That office goes with them. They, re they remain completely resolved to the commitment to follow Christ in the service of others and the washing of feet. But you don't have to become a deacon just to become a priest. Many deacons are called by Christ to remain deacons their entire life. In fact, Paul gives us, both in his first epistle to Timothy and also in his epistle to his spiritual son Titus, standards for ordination for the diaconate. Let me just read those to you. Deacons must be men of dignity, not double-tongued. Dignity in general and specifically in speech, honest and full of integrity of speech, not addicted to much wine. They have to be men who have control over their passions, men who are not uh, addicts or fond of sordid gain. They have to present a model, especially since they have a lot to do with resources and the management of a parish's resources and the development of a parish's properties. They have to be people who have no... Uh, low interests, no earthly ambitions with regards to those things, but be able to deal with them uh, without sticky fingers. Holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. They have to be men who, ha who know the faith, who have studied the faith, who can hold it and maintain it. Deacons are not primarily teachers of the faith. That is in the office of the priest uh, and of the episcopacy. But they have to know the faith. They have to be models of the knowing the faith and following the faith. Not just holding to it, but holding to it with a clear conscience, not being condemned uh, by uh, disobedience. These men also must first be tested and then let them become deacons if they are beyond reproach. So no one should become a deacon quickly. You have to show and live the life of service that's then recognized by his priest and by his community. And they say the oxios and present him to uh, the bishop for consecration. Deacons also must be husbands of one wife, only one wife. That means ever. <laughs> that doesn't mean at a time. One wife. They are models of family life. Managers, good managers of their children, fatherly hearts, and of their own households. For those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves high standing and great confidence in the faith in Christ Jesus. Just like the most wonderful Archdeacon Lawrence, may God raise up a great harvest of holy deacons, and may we all, in imitation of them, embrace the high calling of being the servants of others. Happy feast day. God be with you. One of the most shocking realities of the preaching and teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ to his early first century Judean audience was his fervent, expansive, and repetitive teaching on heaven. Heaven literally permeates the Sermon on the Mount and our Savior's parabolic instruction. The holy apostles received this single-eyed focus upon the next life from the Lord Christ and passed this teaching on to their disciples in the early church. Sacred tradition has vivified and animated the discipleship of Christians in their race toward heaven ever since. In these lectures, Father Josiah opens the scriptures and the writings of the church fathers on the subject of heaven in an effort to plant a deep impression of the future life for God's children and to stir up a great desire for obtaining it. For these and other available titles, please visit our website at patristicnectar.org.